When I was a boy growing up Catholic in the Bronx, I was expected to fast from after dinner on Saturday evening until after Mass on Sunday afternoon. That's around 16 or 18 hours with no food, only water. Coming out of church, we were deliriously hungry, and no one was willing to take the time to cook. But fast foods, convenience foods, were different in those days. They were made with pride and with skill from quality ingredients by people who had actually mastered their trades. So on the way home, we'd pile into Jewish delis and bakeries because those folks already enjoyed their Sabbath the day before and were back on the job. Typically, three or four neighborhood families would take turns as hosts. We would all rush home with the makings of a feast. Bagels and bialis, barrel-cured kosher pickles made in small batches, chopped liver, pastrami, corned beef, and kosher sausages glistening with fat whole loaves of seeded Jewish rye that had a crackly crust the color of honey, and we kids would literally fight each other for the heel because the crust would be about three times thicker. We would have coleslaw, potato salad, and macaroni salad, lox and pickled herring, mandelbrot, rugelach, and babka. Goys like us would wander off the kosher reservation, adding cream cheese, liverwurst, cold cuts, sour cream, and pickled pig's feet. All of it washed down with cold beer, either Ballantines or Rheingold's, of which every child was entitled to a mouthful. That sudden shift from starving for 18 hours to consuming thousands of calories in a couple of hours must have played hell with our blood sugar. I bring that up because it surprised me when I learned how little wiggle room there is for a healthy amount of glucose in our blood. Glucose is a fairly simple monosaccharide, a basic sugar. Virtually every cell in your body depends on it to function. Without it, they shut down. There is roughly 4 grams, or about a teaspoonful, of glucose present at all times in the blood of a healthy 70 kilo or 155 pound human being. Its precise concentration is so crucial to your survival that if your body suddenly stopped replenishing it, you could fall unconscious when you lost around 2.5 grams, or roughly 60% of the normal amount, leaving you with about 1.5 grams, or 40% of normal. That loss of a mere 2.5 gram buffer brings on a condition called hypoglycemia, and it could leave you unable to help yourself or to seek help. Glucose levels below 20% of normal, or about three quarters of a gram, can be fatal in minutes. We have got to replenish our blood sugar constantly and with a precise dose because too much is also toxic, although typically on a longer time scale. So, as I said, very little wiggle room. The steady maintenance of the right chemical balance is called homeostasis. Maintaining a constant, measured supply of glucose is a challenge because we consume it so rapidly. The glucose consumption rate for a healthy adult is 3 milligrams per kilo per minute. For a 70 kilogram adult, that comes to around 200 milligrams per minute, which means that you burn through that crucial 2.5 gram buffer in a mere 12 minutes. That's right. We're all about 12 minutes away from unconsciousness leading to death from hypoglycemia. The range of blood sugar concentration that we can tolerate, the Goldilocks zone, is so narrow and the demand for constant replenishment is so acute that you'd be forgiven for thinking that we might need to eat continually to stay alive. Yet somehow, billions of Catholics escape death from weekly fasting. Well, until the 1960s, when Pope Paul VI loosened the requirements.
it's a miracle that we don't all give up the ghost in our sleep. Of course, we don't, but if we're not eating for six or eight hours overnight, where does the sugar in our blood come from? How do we get a constant and precisely measured supply of glucose when we go hours, and sometimes even days, without eating? Some of you might remember a film comedy called Paul Blart, Mall Cop, the story of an obese action hero who suffered from low blood sugar, or hypoglycemia. His excess weight was a constant source of comic frustration, but he couldn't avoid it because his blood sugar deficit required him to eat sweets all the time. He would lose consciousness at inopportune moments with comic intent. I don't find it all that funny. Overnight hypoglycemia is a known cause of death among type 1 diabetics, and I'd rather not joke about it. But the point is fair. We depend on an uninterrupted supply of glucose, which, if we're metabolically healthy, our bodies provide no matter what we eat or when. That's the miracle of glucose homeostasis. Most adults can consume nothing but water for days at a time, then tuck in like sumo wrestlers, while their blood sugar concentration stays within a narrow range of acceptable limits, much the way our body temperature can remain steady despite changing weather. That's another example of homeostasis. A quick caution here. Heavy or even normal feeding after an extended fast can cause potentially fatal electrolyte imbalances. Before breaking any fast longer than three days, you need to learn about a condition called refeeding syndrome and how to avoid it. It was discovered, tragically, toward the end of the Second World War, when starving prisoners were liberated and suddenly fed, only to become violently, even fatally ill. But for healthy adults, a water-only fast up to 72 hours long is generally regarded as safe, and refeeding syndrome is rarely an issue. So now, let me oversimplify this miracle. Well, two miracles. First, the fact that the body supplies us with glucose when we're not eating. And second, the way it regulates our blood sugar levels with precision regardless of what we eat and when. For supplying glucose, we have two mechanisms. The first is a storage buffer called glycogen, a long-chain branched carbohydrate made of glucose molecules. You can picture it like a snowflake made with Lego bricks, where we can add or remove pieces at will. A lot of glycogen is made from the carbohydrates that we ingest. This is ancient behavior, conserved for billions of years. All animals, fungi, and bacteria make glycogen for sugar storage. Plants also store glucose so that they don't starve when the sun fails to shine, but they make starch rather than glycogen. Glycogen synthesis is called glycogenesis. Among us mammals, it occurs in the liver and in the skeletal muscles. An adult human can store a total of about 500 grams of glycogen. This would last for roughly eight hours if we were to rely on it singly, but of course our bodies replenish it while we're using it, and there are other sources of glucose. During a strict water fast, our liver glycogen will last for 20 to 24 hours, which means that a metabolically healthy adult won't exhaust that buffer overnight. It would be virtually impossible. So glucose storage in the form of glycogen explains why we don't die in our sleep from hypoglycemia. But if glycogen comes mostly from food, what keeps us alive when we fast for several days? There is a second way our bodies supply us with glucose. Instead of assembling a complex sugar that we later break down into simple ones as needed, our bodies can actually manufacture glucose from scratch. This is done in the liver and in the renal cortex in generous amounts, more than sufficient to keep us alive without worry. Even more amazing, your body can make glucose from carbohydrates, as you'd expect, but it can also make it from proteins or fats. This process is called gluconeogenesis, and it means that it's not necessary for you to consume a single molecule of carbohydrate, ever. Now, I'm not saying that you ought not, simply that you need not, and I find that remarkable. We can go farther. Not only can we eliminate carbohydrates from our diets, we don't have to eat, period, at least for a time. 
The demand for an uninterrupted supply of glucose is so keen that our bodies will scavenge the necessary raw materials from our own fat and even muscle tissue. While this is undeniably self-destructive, the evolutionary strategy is to keep us alive despite starvation at any cost to increase the probability that the famine will end, that we'll find something to eat eventually. If we couldn't survive an extended famine, we probably wouldn't have made it as a species. This is why there's so much redundancy in the system, why we can make glucose from virtually any class of substance that we can digest, why we can make it even from our own biomass. And that's something else that the Second World War brought to the public's attention. If you've seen any of the heartbreaking footage or pictures from the camps, you'll know that starving people have very little body fat, as we'd expect, but they also have very little muscle mass. Their arms and legs look the way they do because the body will gradually consume itself to stay alive, thus increasing the probability that we might rescue ourselves or be rescued. And while it might be a ghastly process, it's also an optimistic strategy. Nature has found, through natural selection, that wagering on future food is better for the species than folding early and cutting our collective losses. Regardless of what we eat or don't eat, the liver and renal cortex manufacture glucose in generous amounts. And we can store the excess. We actually make glycogen from our own synthesized glucose. This is what enables us to perform demanding physical tasks even during a fast or while on a low-carbohydrate diet. And that makes perfect sense from an evolutionary point of view. If we've been starving for a while, we mustn't become weak from hypoglycemia because getting food might be physically demanding. It could involve climbing trees or rock faces, running, digging up roots and tubers, setting snares and checking them regularly bringing down megafauna or raiding nearby settlements, all of which require sharp senses, muscular strength, and endurance. Therefore, even when we are running on endogenous glucose alone, muscle glycogen levels remain normal, which is why athletes can follow a low-carb or ketogenic or carnivore diet. Carb loading will always offer a small boost, perhaps by topping up our reserves of liver glycogen, but the body maintains normal levels of blood glucose and muscle glycogen even if we eat nothing except proteins and fats. If that were not the case, keto dieters, like me, and carnivore dieters would be unable to participate in sports, even casually. You'd be exhausted within minutes. I suppose I should disclose that I've been following a very low-carb diet for over three years now, and I've got no plans to stop. I combined that with daily fasting for 18 hours overnight, just like the old days. I eat from noon until 6 p.m. and limit my daily carbohydrate intake to below 50 grams, aiming for 30. Just as hypoglycemia can be life-threatening, so can hyperglycemia. Persistently high blood glucose contributes to the familiar complications of diabetes heart and kidney disease, poor circulation and nerve damage leading to amputations and blindness, and overall poor health resulting in a shortened lifespan. So again, we need just the right amount of glucose to be healthy. A typical adult can fast or feast while the body keeps its fuel mixture in the Goldilocks zone. But how? With such tight margins for blood sugar concentrations, how on earth do we regulate it so precisely over such a broad range of nutritional conditions that can change suddenly and drastically? I'm sure that everyone has heard that the pancreas is heavily involved in glucose homeostasis. It secretes two important hormones, insulin and glucagon, that regulate blood sugar concentrations continually. Let's learn how the fuel mixture is kept in the ideal range. First, there's insulin, which can transport glucose molecules into our muscle and fat cells when blood concentrations get too high to prevent hyperglycemia, and of course to nourish those cells because they routinely use insulin for glucose transport. Second, we have glucagon, short for glucose agonist. 
it stimulates glucose production through gluconeogenesis and through glycogen breakdown to keep our blood sugar supply going while our cells are taking it up and using it for fuel. It prevents hypoglycemia. You might think that the body uses one, then the other, in an alternating pattern depending on our needs, but that would be too laggy. So instead, the pancreas secretes both insulin and glucagon together, altering the relative amounts in a constant process of self-correction. In other words, the throttle is always open and the brakes are always engaged. The only thing that changes is the ratio of throttle opening to braking force. Your body has the habit of driving with both feet. Your pancreas synthesizes and secretes both hormones, largely regulating itself, incredible as that might seem. Glucagon is made by what are called alpha cells, and insulin is made by so-called beta cells. The amount of each hormone that the cells release is affected directly by the concentration of glucose in the blood. Because this isn't quite confusing enough, it appears that the hypothalamus is also involved in sensing blood glucose concentrations and signaling the pancreas. Additionally, there are nutrient sensors in the gut that respond to the presence of sugars we've eaten, which in turn release their own hormones, signaling the pancreas. The extent to which these other mechanisms contribute to sugar homeostasis is still under investigation. They might be more backup systems than primary contributors or not. One thing's for sure, this level of complexity gives us non-diabetics a clue about why treating diabetes is a lot trickier than merely injecting a bit of insulin now and then. But for the majority of us who enjoy normal sugar control, the process of glucose homeostasis is stupidly easy. We can eat a lot or a little, now or later, or not at all for a while, and everything works with astonishing precision. Until it doesn't. I mean, if you abuse this system long term, you greatly increase the probability of developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, but that's a topic for a separate video. Well, that's about all I've got for today. Right now, I'm testing several different kinds of content to see what works. I'll be back in a week or two, so keep in touch. Cheers!